Hello, my name is Mia Minnis. I'm a professor at the University of California in San Diego, and I'm very happy to be here today speaking with you about some of the impacts of computing. Our plan for today is to talk about scenarios where information should be shared by some people and kept secret from others. We'll talk about computational strategies to achieve this, and we'll see how modular arithmetic shows up in some of these strategies. Our motivating question is an old one. It's this question of how do we get information from a sender like me to a receiver like you? Historically, couriers were used where I could relay my message to a courier who would then travel far and wide to get it to you. The problem is when the message is sensitive and perhaps I don't want the courier to have access to the contents of the message. How do I make sure that the couriers can't read the message, but you can? A very old solution to this problem is attributed to Julius Caesar. The Caesar cipher is a method of hiding the information that's encoded in our message from the courier, but then revealing the message to the intended source. So a cipher is a procedure for doing just that, making a message secret so that it is readable by and only by the intended recipient. Let's take an example. So think of the message San Diego. And suppose I wanted to send the message San Diego to you. What I would do if I were using the Caesar cipher is first remove all characters that weren't letters. So I could make the characters uppercase and I could remove the space between San Diego. Now the crux of the Caesar cipher is to replace each letter in my message by a different letter in the alphabet. And the way that I choose the letter that I'm going to replace S with and then A with and then N with, et cetera, is by shifting the letters forward in the alphabet. So if I shift each letter forward by say 15, then I could count starting at S forward in the alphabet 15 spots and find the new letter that I'm going to send. Now, you might remember that the English alphabet has 26 letters. And if so, if so, if I count forward from S15, I'm going to fall off the end of the alphabet. And I don't want to do that. So with a Caesar cipher, we count forward and then cycle around. What that gives us is an association from each original letter to a shifted letter. So looking up where S gets assigned, it will become H. A will become P etc. And we get the coded message HPCSXTVD. That's the essence of the Caesar cipher. The things to notice are that we have to agree on the shift that we're going to use in this example 15. And that in order to implement the coding mechanism, what I have to do is calculate for each letter in my message what letter to replace it with after I do this shift. And so let's think about algorithmically or computationally how I determine that letter I'm going to replace each letter in my message by. The idea is to use the position of the letters in the alphabet to determine the shifted letter. So if we think about laying out all of the alphabet in alphabetical order, we can give each letter in the alphabet an index a gets index 0, B gets index 1, etc., all the way through to S, that first letter in my message, which has index 18. Then what we'd like to do is shift over the index by 15, that's the shift we agreed on, and calculate the index of the new letter. So now we have to think about a mathematical way of expressing that 18 should go to 7, 0 to 15, 13 to 2, etc. One thing to keep in mind is that we're shifting forward, so that feels like addition. But if we just straight ahead go 18 plus 15, we'll get the index 33. And that's not an allowed position in our alphabet because we only have 26 letters. That means that the indices we use go from 0 through 25. Here's where modular arithmetic comes in. So to remind ourselves, modular arithmetic is related to integer division. This idea of associating integers with one another by expressing them relative to integer multiples of some modulus. 
So we have the division theorem that says, whenever we have an integer n and a positive integer m, there are integers q and r such that n equals qm plus r. And we can choose those q and r uniquely when we impose the constraint that r is between zero and m minus one inclusive. So q here is our quotient upon dividing n by m, and r, which is gonna be really important for us, is the remainder upon dividing n by m. So r is going to be what we mean when we say n mod m. We're saying the remainder upon dividing n by m. And so now let's play around with remainders for a bit just to see how they might be helpful in implementing the Caesar cipher. So I'd like to calculate some small uh, remainders here. And since we're thinking about shifting letters in the alphabet, our modulus, our m, is 26. So 0 mod 26 is 0, because when we think of dividing 0 by 26, we can write 0 as 0 times 26 plus a remainder of 0. If we add 1 to the number we're dividing by 26, we don't get any bigger a quotient. We add 1 to the remainder. So for these small numbers, when we say, what's the remainder when we divide 3 by 26? Just 3 itself. As we keep on incrementing the numbers we're dividing by 26, we're getting bigger and big remainders. And then we have a tipping point when we get to 26 and we divide it by itself, by 26. At that point, the quotient is 1. And we write 26 as 1 times 26 plus a remainder of 0. And then notice as we, in, in, as we continue this pattern, when we think about 27 mod 26, we're back to a remainder of 1. 28 mod 26 is a remainder of 2. And as we think about larger and larger numbers, mod 26, we end up cycling through the remainders. So we see remainders 0, 1, 2, all the way through to 24, 25, and then back to 0, 1, 2. And modular arithmetic lets us implement a cycle. And that's exactly what we were looking for with a Caesar cipher. So remember, we were thinking of shifting forward. That's like addition and then cycling around uh, to avoid falling off the edge of the alphabet. That's taking mod. So let's go back to the calculation of what letter is going to replace S. And S was at index 18. We want to shift forward by 15. That gives us 33. To get back to the allowed indices in the alphabet, we take mod 26 and we're at 7, which is what we got when we brute force calculated going forward from S and stepping forward 15 times to reach H, which was at index 7. Similarly, we can do the calculation for A, and we notice that that's an example of one of those small numbers we're taking remainders. Here we've got 0 plus 15 mod 26 just gives us 15, and 15 indeed is the position of P. The letter will replace A by. So with Caesar cipher, the sender, after writing the message, removing the spaces and punctuation, writing uppercase versions of the letters, and translating the letters to numbers, the sender uses modular arithmetic to shift forward and uh, receive the letters that need to be part of the coded message. The receiver then has to recover the original intended meaning of the message from HPCSXTVD. But the receiver has an additional piece of information. The receiver and the sender agreed ahead of time that the shift will be 15. So the receiver can translate this coded message to numbers and shift backwards by 15 using modular arithmetic to translate back to the original message. And that way, Julius Caesar and his army generals or the sender and the receiver using the Caesar cipher can communicate securely using this cipher. The benefits of this cipher is that it uses a translation of letters to numbers which are part of the language of computers. So computers um, already store data in the machine as numbers. And so they're well suited to working with numerical representations of our information. Moreover, modular arithmetic is built into lots of the programming languages that we use. And so these operations can be implemented quickly and efficiently. There are disadvantages too, though. The Caesar cipher is actually really easy to crack. If there was 
a third party observer who was looking at the flow of coded messages going back and forth, that third party observer could tabulate all of the letters that they saw most frequently and second most frequently and third most frequently, compare those patterns to patterns that are known about English language and infer that shift that we used to code and decode our messages and then crack all of our um, hidden information. So this Caesar cipher is not actually very secure at all. Thankfully, there's been a lot of work done since the time of Julius Caesar. Um, a wonderful book by Simon Singh is called The Code Book, and it traces the historical progression of coding strategies and decoding strategies, as well as uh, these code breaking approaches uh, through the ages to uh, the really sophisticated schemes that are used uh, more um, in modern days. In all of these schemes though, there's a central uh, premise or assumption, which is that the sender and the receiver have to agree on some important secret piece of information so that the sender and the receiver can communicate and the third party observer won't be able to know what's being sent. In the example of the Caesar cipher, that shared piece of information that we needed to agree on was the shift that we were using to convert the original message to the coded message, how many letters forward we were going in the alphabet. With more modern codes, different kinds of information needs to be shared, but there's still this question of how do we communicate that shared piece of information. This question is all that much more urgent in modern communication when our communication is often done not by couriers, but through the internet. And where I might want to speak with people I've never met before in person with uh, people who are far away from me. And so somehow you and I need to agree on this uh, secret piece of information without being physically located in the same place ever. This conundrum is called public key exchange. And we can uh, frame it as how do two strangers agree on a number that needs to be secret to everyone else? And these two strangers need to come to that agreement using communication that may be public, that may be available to uh, people listening in. So this was a central problem for many, many years. Uh, very hard to think about how to even start developing codes that require some shared information. And uh, the first discoveries around public key exchange um, were, were suggested in the 70s. Martin Hellman, who was one of those early researchers um, who developed public key exchange, has a beautiful thought experiment that gives an idea as to how we can actually solve this problem. So let's work through that thought experiment. The idea is that I have a suitcase filled with some treasure and I wanna send it across a crowded room uh, with some intended recipient at the other corner of the room uh, waiting for, for, for my treasure for the suitcase. But between us, there's lots of other people. And if I send the treasure in the suitcase, to my intended recipient by passing it to someone in the room who's gonna pass it to someone else, who's gonna pass it to someone else, et cetera, then anyone along the chain can just open the suitcase and take the treasure. That's not a secure form of uh, transferring the treasure to my intended recipient. Um, and not only is my intended recipient far away, but I don't have an opportunity to, uh, to go into some other room with them and collaborate or confer privately to share any information before we have to do this exchange. All right, so how are we gonna do this? One thing I could do is to solve the problem of people in the middle taking the treasure is to lock the suitcase. So I can lock the suitcase, keep the key to the lock, and then send the suitcase across the crowded room to my intended recipient. At this point, no one along the, the chain was able to take the treasure. But unfortunately, my intended recipient can't take the treasure either. They're standing there with a locked suitcase. The brilliant part 
of this next um, step of the, of the public key exchange is that my intended recipient can also lock the suitcase with their own lock. So imagine a briefcase or a suitcase that has a handle that we're locking and there's space on that handle for two separate locks. I've got my lock here and then my intended recipient puts a separate lock next to it. My intended recipient sends the suitcase full of treasure back to me. No one along the chain was able to open it and take our treasure. Um, and when the suitcase comes back to me, I can't open it because I can't open my uh, intended recipient's lock. But what I can do is remove my own lock. So I remove my own lock and now I'm still faced with a locked suitcase in front of me. So I feel comfortable sending it back into the crowded room towards my intended recipient. And at that point, once the locked suitcase makes its way back to the intended recipient, they now are holding a suitcase that has one lock on it, but that lock was their lock. And so they can open it, open the suitcase and get the treasure. So at that point, uh, once they get the suitcase back, they have access to the treasure. This uh, procedure allows us to keep the treasure safe from everyone in the middle. It's at the cost of a slightly slower process or algorithm because we had to send the suitcase back and forth a couple of times. Um, but paying that cost means getting the security of me sending the treasure to the intended recipient without compromising it along the way. This thought experiment or idea is about a physical treasure with physical suitcases. When we're thinking about codes and conveying information, the treasure is that number, that shared secret I want to have with my intended recipient, you, who I want to send a message to. And we need to come up with a mathematical way of implementing the idea of suitcases and locks. So here is um, one approach to public key exchange. And this algorithm is, or protocol is known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. So I start with my own private number. I don't tell anyone what that number is. And I calculate something that's related to this number that I publicly post. You start with your own private number. You calculate something related to that number that you publicly post. And then what we want to be able to do is combine the public versions of our numbers in some way so that the result of that combination is a shared secret number that we each will be able to calculate, but that no one else will calculate. So other third parties who are listening into our communications, they're hearing just the public facing versions of our numbers, and they shouldn't be able to calculate the shared secret number that we will have just from those public facing versions. That sounds impossible. The key to making this work is to find pairs of functions, mathematical functions that have interesting computational or algorithmic properties. Those functions are gonna come from modular arithmetic. So before we talked about um, modular addition, now we're gonna talk about modular exponentiation. And the key result that makes all of this work is that when we take exponents, we can compute them in either order. So if we raise some base g to the eighth power and then the bth power, that's the same thing as raising it first to the bth power and then the eighth power. And we can reduce mod m and get the same result. The way that this helps is that if we publicly agree on some large prime number and some primitive root g, and if you don't know what the, the meaning of prime is or primitive root is, that's okay. It's not gonna be relevant for following along with the algorithm. Um, I'll, I'll come back to some of these definitions later. But we agree on some large numbers and everyone in the world can know about these no large numbers. What we then do is that I pick my own private number a, you pick your own private number a, and we calculate what it we get when we raise g to the a and then calculate the remainder upon division by p. And then the thing that we share publicly 
is the result of this modular exponentiation. So I publish what g to the a mod p is, but I don't publish a. You publish what g to the b mod p is, but you don't publish b. I can calculate g to the b a mod p because I hear g to the b from you and I know my own a. You can calculate g to the a to the b mod p because you hear my g to the a mod p and you know your own b. And because of modular exponentiation, allowing us to raise um, our bases to the powers in either order, we get the same shared secret number. G to the b a, g to the b to the a mod p is equal g to the a to the b mod p. And so we get this shared secret number, but hopefully no one else does. So let's think about that. We can run through some numbers, but once we have the same shared secret number, we can use it to encode and decode messages to one another, and we hope that the protocol is secure. So if we think about security, we should be able to perform the calculations that are necessary for getting to that shared secret, and no one else should be able to practically calculate what that shared secret is. So on us is the task of doing the modular exponentiation because we had to calculate g to the a mod p, and then we had to calculate g to the b to the a mod p. And so we're doing a couple of modular exponentiations, whereas an eavesdropper, a third party listening in, would need to do a modular exponentiation after reverse engineering our secret a or our secret b to discover the private numbers. The heart of security of a protocol like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol is that modular exponentiation can be programmed to be uh, very efficient, to be um, so that we can calculate modular exponentiation involving really, really big numbers, um, exponents that are hundreds of digits long, but we can still calculate um, the results of modular exponentiation in reasonable amounts of time. On the other hand, there are no known algorithms to efficiently calculate the discrete logarithm to be able to go from the result of modular exponentiation to uncover what that power was, what the exponent was. And so this uh, asymmetry, this tension between functions that are computed, computationally practical to compute and reversing them would be impractical is what gives us the security of this public key exchange. In looking at these two uh, applications of information sharing and hiding, what we're seeing is that modular arithmetic and properties of functions are at the heart of many computational approaches to sharing and protecting information. And when we think about the properties of these approaches, we need to think about what information is going to be broadcast publicly, what we need to secure privately, and what computational resources each of the participants in the protocol has access to. Thank you.